Hello and welcome to today's Daily Bible Reading. We are continuing through Isaiah. We're looking at chapters 53 and 54 and then John chapter 8. Let's pray. Father, speak to us. Help us now to hear what your Holy Spirit would say through your word. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to respond. Bless those who are joining with me now in this daily Bible reading. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, this is Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All. We like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is one of the most profound prophecies of the work of Christ. It describes his birth, growing up, where there was this misconception that we see, and we saw in yesterday's reading, that the Jews believed the Messiah would just appear without, strangely, having an upbringing. So we, we read about Christ's upbringing. It correlates to what we read about in the Gospels. We read about his ministry, healing the sick. That correlates to what we read in the Gospels. That he is put to death as an atoning sacrifice, clearly the statement of the New Testament. That he was buried in a rich man's tomb, clearly fulfilled by what we see in the Gospels. And that he rose again from the dead. And now... He intercedes, exactly as the New Testament says. And to c consider that this was given in the 8th century BC and, s and all of these details related to the ministry and the atonement of, of Christ were fulfilled is breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. Isaiah chapter 54. Sing, O barren one, who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labour, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. 
For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed. But my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of agate and your gates of carbuncles and all your wall of precious stones. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, and you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose, I have also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication from me declares the Lord. And following on from Isaiah's prophecy of the redeeming and atoning work of the Messiah, this to me sounds as if God's describing his new covenant bride. And we, I, I think it's, it's easy for people to think that when the church was founded, no Jews received Christ as their Messiah. And that's not true. We read through the early chapters of the book of Acts and there were thousands of Jews who turned to Christ and accepted him as the fulfillment of the prophetic statements about the Messiah and received him as the Messiah and as Christ. And God was taking a new bride not just of Jews, but of Jews and Gentiles. And this will unfold as we continue through Isaiah as well. And so we'll, we'll see how this correlates to the New Testament. We come now to John. Now let me tell you about the opening section. In the English Standard Version, as with most modern translations, it will have a translator's note, or a publisher's note at least, where it says the earliest manuscripts do not include John chapter 7 verse 53, which curiously is put at the start of John chapter 8. Not, it's not really curious, but I'll explain that in a moment. And chapter 8 verse 11. And it's the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery. Now, here's what my studies have revealed about scriptural editing. Editing means that the oldest manuscripts may not be the, the manuscripts that were that, that ended up being admitted into what's called the canon of Scripture. Now, it may be that what we have here is actually an ancient manuscript. Now, the, the, the translators have said the earliest manuscripts don't contain this. Now, what I have in my research found is that there are, there are things where I believe, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, they've been added by divine inspiration to Scripture to clarify things, to correct maybe a scribal error, or perhaps for some reason a scribe didn't include it. There was an available earlier manuscript to a scribe where he said, hang on, they, they left this chunk out, has put it in, but the other manuscripts are far more common and maybe the word is extant, which means they have some of those have survived, whereas the, the other ones haven't in, in popularity but in this instance it has, and I believe under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And here's why I think this is actually divine scripture, that it actually, verses chapter 7, 53, and to 8, chapter 11, is actually part of scripture. Number one, it fits. 
it fits perfectly. It reflects what we know about Christ. It tells us something about what we know uh, Christ would have said. So in that sense, there is nothing in here that contradicts any, anything else in Scripture. In fact, it complements that. Let's read the passage. I'll discuss it a little bit and see if we can see why I believe it should be considered part of Scripture. They each went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. All right, a couple of things. Why didn't Jesus obey the law? And the reason is very, very simple. Because after all, the scriptures say, that Jesus fulfilled everything in the law. He fulfilled every dot, every dash, everything. He fulfilled it. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it, and he did. So what we have here is the, the Pharisees presenting a woman caught in the act of adultery, but the law says the man and the woman. The man and the woman. She wasn't the only guilty party in this. Now, other speculation is when they were making this barrage at Christ, he, he bent down and he wrote in the dirt. What did he write? Some have cheekily suggested that he wrote down the names of their mistresses, the Pharisees, all male, that he wrote down the names of the women that they were committing adultery with. Uh, as cheeky as, and as appealing as that is, it's probably not accurate, probably. What did he write down? He probably wrote down the relevant aspect of the law of Moses they were referring to, <laughs> which says the man and the woman. Now, if you're going to do this, you're breaking that law. And if you've never broken the law and you're not breaking it today, you can throw the first stone. And that's probably what happened. They read it and they dropped their rocks from the oldest down to the youngest and they left. And it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of the heart of God revealed through Christ. And it also reveals in the, in the closing statement, go and sin no more. Jesus is not, for, not overlooking this. He's forgiving this. And you only forgive what you need, what you acknowledge is, was a wrongdoing. We continue on, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisee said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. Now that is a clue, quite possibly, to that opening text. That may have been the next thing he wrote down. Where is their witnesses? That's, it corresponds. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him 
because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Now why did they respond that way? Because Christ has now invoked the divine name of God, Yahweh. Unless you believe I am Yahweh. And, and the way it would have come across is, unless you believe Ego Ami, unless you believe I am, which is Yahweh, the, the divine name of God, you will die in your sins. It also, it, it also makes a point that some people believe God is inclusive of all religions. It doesn't matter what religion, as long as you're sincere. Christ's death will atone for you, no matter what your religion. But here Jesus is speaking to very religious people, very religious Jews, and he says, you're going to die in your sins. And, and this highlights the fact, it's not about your religion, it's about your standing with Christ. God has offered Christ as your atonement, your sacrifice for your sins. What have you done with him? What have you done with him? Because that's the answer that, that, that God is looking for on the day of judgment. If you have said, I've received him, I've turned to him, and I've worshipped him, he is my Lord. Right answer, come on in. I'm, I'm making it a bit of a, a light thing in one sense, because I don't think that exchange will actually happen. But that's the intent of what it means to, to be saved, that you have Christ, you've received his forgiveness, you're walking with him, you've followed him. So when someone says, I, I, don't, I don't think it matters what religion you are as long as you're sincere, Right there, red letter, words of Jesus, that cannot be true. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say to you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I want you to note, there the whole verse because oftentimes you hear people say the truth will set you free as if it's any random truth but the first half of the verse is you abide in my word if you abide in my word you will know the truth and the truth will set you free so the truth is actually found in the word of God verse 33 they answered him we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone how is it that you say you will become free Jesus answered them Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. Now, why on? Where did that come from? Because of the rumor that Jesus and that Jesus was born as a product of Joseph and Mary's illegitimate relationship, possibly. There's another theory, uh, Panthera, I think it is. It's, it's, uh, it's a play on the word virgin, but it actually, cl the claim, and a very late claim too, not, not, didn't originate in the first century, that, uh, or late, it may have originated in the late first century, that, that Mary was actually raped by a Roman soldier. Either way, We've got immorality being the accusation here. 
it's an it's a really really low blow really so this is what they say to him we have one father even god jesus said to them if god were your father you would love me for i came from god and i am here i came not of my own accord but he sent me why do you not understand what i say it is because you cannot bear to hear my word you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him when he lies he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies but because i tell you the truth you do not believe me which one of you convicts me of sin if i tell the truth why do you not believe me whoever is of god hears the words of god the reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Note there that Jesus is straight up saying, I've never sinned. Go ahead, accuse me of a sin. And there was silence. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honour my Father and you dishonour me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God, but you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Whoosh! That would have been an interesting, an interesting event to have witnessed. You could see the incredible tension there. But the, the, res, the resoluteness of Christ, absolutely adamant. There, there could be no confusion that Christ is saying he is the eternal God in the flesh. The eternal Son of God. He uses the divine title, the Son of Man. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you that we see in your word the plan of redemption, the center, the foreground of the box lid, the jigsaw box lid of your word, Christ redeeming people through his own death. Isaiah prophesied it. Jesus has just talked about it in John chapter 8. And Father, we just give you great thanks, great praise that because of what Jesus did, we can live beyond the grave. We can know you now. We can have peace as the prophet Isaiah foretold that those who come to Christ will experience the peace of God. And peace really only matters in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of confusion. And so Father, I pray, for everyone joining with me now in this daily Bible reading, no matter where they are, in Hobart, in Adelaide, in Brisbane, in Perth, Western Australia, in Melbourne, Victoria, in San Diego, California, in Wales, UK, no matter where people are watching right now, that they would experience your peace, the peace that belongs to the child of God because of, because of Christ, being in Christ. And thank you, Lord, for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming on this journey. And my apologies for explaining so much and sort of maybe a bit too much. But anyway, I, I thank you for being patient with me today. Please give this a thumbs up if you haven't yet subscribed. Please become a subscriber. Come on this journey. Join with the many people that are now making this a part of their day. And I uh, really appreciate if you can complete this 365 or 366 days and, and make your way through the Bible in a year. You'll see me tomorrow for our next Daily Bible.